close your eyes. Really close your eyes. Not all of you are closing your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and imagine the very first time you had to fill out a complex tax return. Now imagine the very first time you had to balance your checkbook. And now imagine, if this applies to you, the very first time you realized that as convenient as it was, that credit card was a very dangerous instrument. And if you didn't pay off your balance at the end of every month, the ongoing balance would grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and perhaps faster than what you could cope with. You can open your eyes. Did that bring back any anxieties? Did that bring back any fear? When I was in sixth grade, I had a math teacher who was trying to do something nice for me and two other students, fearing that we would be bored with the material that she was giving to the rest of the class. She gave the three of us a real income tax return. And this was not a 1040 EZ. This was long before the days of 1040 EZ. This was a 1975 tax return. We took one look at this and thought to ourselves, if this is what growing up means, that we have to fill out one of these, we don't want to grow up. <laughs> it was terrifying in a number of different ways, in part because half of the terminology we didn't understand. And we were bright students at a private school. If we could not understand the terminology, how can we expect the majority of our country's citizens to understand how to fill one of these things out? Now, it's not the end of the world if you can't fill out a tax return, because thankfully we have CPAs who can do that for us, and for a reasonable price. But what happens if we grow up without the privilege of having dedicated parents who teach us how to open a bank account, how to understand a lease, how to understand a mortgage, how to balance a checkbook, how to budget for our daily lives and plan ahead. We are one of the very few, maybe the only, rich industrialized nation in the world that doesn't require personal finance or economics in high school. This <coughs> is a scandal that we should be ashamed of. We are not preparing our students, maybe for a lot of things, <laughs> but we're definitely not preparing them to be rational economic citizens. When we think about this whole financial crisis that we're still grappling with and may grapple with the, the fallout of that crisis for years to come, it's easy to blame those evil Wall Street bankers. And yes, maybe they are partly to blame. But what about all those mortgage brokers who took advantage of people who really did not understand what a teaser rate was or how a mortgage really worked and that their interest payments really would balloon beyond their capacity to pay it off after four or five years? We can blame those citizens, perhaps. Why didn't they read the fine print? 
Why didn't they carefully evaluate the risks involved? However, how can we expect them to do that when we're not preparing them? It is our duty as a government to give our citizens a basic K-12 education that prepares them for the basics of life. And being able to manage our personal finances is a basic skill of life. Yesterday, I was driving down Pacific Avenue, and I saw hundreds, maybe even a thousand, school children protesting in front of City Hall about the billions of dollars that are being cut from our state's education budget this year. On top of the cuts that were made last year, this is a tragedy at so many levels. We can't even begin to talk about adding economics to our curriculum when we're cutting billions of dollars and perhaps leaving them even more ill-prepared. I would argue that we are laying the groundwork for another financial crisis by ignoring our K-12 educational system and ignoring the role that economics or personal finance can play in that curriculum. We're laying the groundwork for another crisis because if we don't prepare our citizens to understand personal finance, investing and saving for our retirement, the difference between a bond and a stock, how can we expect that invisible hand of capitalism to work? If the people don't understand the rules of the game. I'm an economist, and in economics and all of our models and economic theories, we are implicitly assuming that every member of society is a rational economic actor. We now know that that is a false assumption, which is why the field of behavioral economics has taken off in recent years. Because now we can better understand that people are illogical by nature. I want to go back to stocks and bonds. Right now, we're in this huge, huge budget crisis here in California. Why are we in such a budget crisis? Yes, you can blame Prop 13, but we also have all of these propositions that we as, as voters have voted on when most of us do not understand that a bond measure means you're giving a credit card to the politicians and letting them borrow as much money as they need to borrow to spend money on that particular item without any requirement for coming up with a way to pay for it. And so we have all of these required expenditures and no way to pay for it. In conclusion, let me say, tell you a story about a meeting I had with the late Senator Fulbright. I invited myself to his office <laughs> after being awarded Fulbright, and he, he and I had a wonderful discussion for about half an hour, and at the end of the discussion he said, so you're going to go out there and make a difference? I was young and felt I hadn't accomplished anything in my life yet. And I told him, I'm going to try. And so I, I'm trying to do my little bit by making a difference by teaching economics and by lobbying for economic education in our K-12 system.